trouble with, where was it? Um, it was in chapter... All right, perfect. So, in chapter nine, right? So in chapter nine, we, um, we were looking at this wheezy oligopoly Right. And, 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 you know, we figured out what this C point was in terms of we have to uh, double the slope of the demand curve and then, you know, graph it from that same starting point. Right. And, you know, it's, it's like when you when you lock your car. What? What's going on, Dom? What's, what's the secret? Do I need to separate it? Uh -huh, me too. Me too. Ah, you could call it like that, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Uh, what, what, was, what was the name of the, the, the brothers in shop? Beats Beats? No, it's the, friend, the brothers. They had a Beasley something. I can't remember. Anyways, yeah. Oh, the twins? Yeah, the twins. All right. They're good books. I highly recommend them. You can get illustrated versions these days, too. They're up to book three. Yeah, they're very good. You can get them at the Costco and stuff. Regardless, so uh, <laughs> uh, so how did we how did we start? So we had another marginal revenue curve, right? Because why? Because there's this. What is it? <laughs> Weasley's wizard Weezer. That's quite a tongue twister. Weasley's wizard Weezer. Easier to read than say. All right, moving on. <laughs> so, uh, so we have this king point, right? And so the actual demand curve that we're facing as an oligopolist is the blue part, right? That lower envelope. And so why is that? Because we have some assumptions about the uh, Weasley or Sweezy oligopoly, right? In terms of each firm believes that rivals will cut their prices in response to price reduction, so they're going to match it. So it's a more elastic demand curve there. Uh, but will not raise their prices in response to a price increase, right? So that's why uh, if we have a price increase, we're going to lose a significant more amount of quantity in terms of percentage quantity than we're going to gain in percentage price. We're going to lose revenue if we increase because why? Other people are going to essentially be, we're going to be giving up market share to other people. We're not going to steal it. We're going to be increasing price and just like giving it to them on a silver platter. Uh, whereas if we have a price decrease, the competitors are going to match the price decrease. Why are they going to match the price decrease? Because we are all producing uh, at you know some pretty good margins, right? So we have room to cut the price. If we were right at that marginal cost, we couldn't really cut the price and still be having those uh, abnormally large economic profits. So they're going to cut the price uh, in response to our price cut. And so as a result, instead of staying on this awesome demand curve, right, um, where if we cut the price, then there'd be this huge increase in quantity demand and that would probably increase our total revenue. No, we're going to get jumped onto this crappy demand curve here because everybody's going to copy it. And so we're going to cut the price and we're not, we're going to barely get, uh, you know, the same amount of percentage quantity demanded when we have the percentage change decrease in quantity in price. So that's what's going on with our demand curves and why it's kinked, right? And so in order to put the pieces together of where the C and this E are, so we figured out that we, we have to get the marginal revenue curve, right? It's twice the slope of the first, of the second demand curve, I apologize. And it starts at the same slope, at the same point A. The same thing's going on with D1. So we, we double the slope of it, and we have to extend that demand curve all the way up to its origin point. And that's where the marginal revenue curve starts. And so that point E, so I think, I believe it was 20, for example, on Wednesday, uh, is where the marginal revenue curve crosses that Q zero, right? That optimal quantity, right? And why is it that we want our marginal cost uh, curve to fall somewhere between C and E? What does that give us if it, if it falls somewhere between C and E? It makes sure our price, it makes sure our profit optimizing quantity is at that key point. Yes, so it's our profit maximization because we always, always, always produce where our marginal revenue crosses our marginal cost, right? So what if my marginal cost curve were instead uh, down here, right? What if we had an 
C3, or MC2, rather. Then we're always going to produce for the marginal revenue equals the marginal cost, because that's our profit maximizing. So this is our Q naught star. We go up here because we would never charge that price. We always go up to the demand curve, because our demand curve is what? Also known as our willingness to pay, right? So why would we charge less than our willingness to pay? That's just bad business. Um, so we're going to charge this amount, right, which is less than the P0. And so as a result, uh, even though this is profit maximizing for our current marginal costs, it's not profit maximizing, you know, relative to the rest of the industry. So, you know, if, if we were able to cut our marginal costs somehow, right, exactly. Or actually it would be, Our marginal costs are too low, right? So this is kind of a weird situation where our marginal costs are too low. I mean, we're going to be producing too much. And so, this, you know, this just has to do with the, the law of supply and demand, right? In terms of when you produce a lot of a particular product, the price is going to go down, right? Why? Because why, why is the price up here in the first place? You know, artificial scarcity. You know, Beers has done this amazing thing in the last hundred years plus years of monopolizing all the diamond production and, 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 you know, generating this whole notion that, you know, diamond is forever and it's part of this romantic thing. I mean, that is, that is hundred percent, um, implanted market. Even the notion that how much of a man's salary should be spent on an engagement ring or a person's salary to be politically correct, right? Um, uh, how much of a, of, a, of a person's salary should be, right? Do you guys know? It's one month. It's total bullshit that they made up. <laughs> Doesn't come from anywhere. <laughs> mm -hmm. But they also control the scarcity of it, right? And then here's the brilliant thing. So what, is, what has happened in the last 10 or so years, or 15 years with uh, diamonds? What's been the main competitor? What's a, what's a close substitute to a diamond? I mean, emeralds and all other rubies and stuff are way rarer and, all, in my opinion, prettier. No, no, no. It, it looks exactly like a diamond, except if you have a, a, a Looper's Jewel, you can see a slight difference because they're artificially produced diamonds, right? So instead of having some claws, they have no claws. But they're just as hard and this and the other thing, right? And so a lot of, like, Brilliant Earth is one of the main brands that, that uses that. Um, Swarovski or whatever, right? They're, they're, they're a huge brand of, of kind of, like, it's not really costume jewelry, but it's cheap, nice jewelry that uses these um, fake, uh, or, or not fake, uh, man-made diamonds, right? And so here's what De Beers is doing now because this has been eating into some of their market share. They have their own line of man-made diamond stuff that they're making look, and this is what critics say, and I agree with this, that they're making look purposely like cheap and crappy to try and diminish the brand of the main made diamonds so that their diamonds can go and retain their value. I know, it's pretty, it's pretty good. It's pretty good, honestly. It's not a bad idea. It is, it is good economics, for sure. Um, have a treasure map and you yeah. need someone to finance the expedition, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yo, so, yo, ho! So like,
Landmarks. Sure. Okay, so two things, two things that, that um, so, so the first thing is there's a very seminal article um, that I want to mention, and I will uh, also put this as an announcement out to everybody, but it's known as AJR 2001, Osimo, Blue, Johnson, and Robinson 2001, and it's about um, institutions, and it's specifically about uh, colonial settler mortality rate and how this is the best uh, instrument for institutional quality today. So this is, you know, 200 years ago. Institutional <laughs> Quality today. So what do I mean by institutional quality, right? Um, well, essentially, you know, if there is a abuse of power and some sort of natural resource or somebody that is taking advantage of some property that, you know, is not theirs to take advantage of, like this person, you know, even if, even if he didn't have, you know, the school children doing the slave labor and not cutting them in, you know, total, total big move. Um, but even if he didn't do that, right, um, then the government, you know, should come in and, you know, make sure that, the, it, you know, the land is being mined responsibly and, you know, sustainably or whatever, right, and that, you know, a cut of those profits are going to be, um, you know, invested back into the economy, right, in terms of roads and education and, you know, internet and just, just, just things that are necessary for commerce and for development, right? But instead, what happens is the, inst the institutional quality is not that good. And so instead, the people that have the power, right? The people that are in charge of the people with the guns that come in and say, hey, you can't be here anymore and take over it and fence it and guard it and stuff, right? Those people are gonna do what? They're gonna line the pockets of their friends and their constituents and you know, maybe even some regions of the country that are um, you know, not necessarily shored up politically for them, right? You know, this is a really big problem in Greece. You know, when somebody comes to, comes to power in Greece, they will uh, enlarge the public sector of Greece like tremendously in certain regions of the country so that that region will then vote for them or their party in the future. But what this does is it ends up creating such a bloat and, and, and there's like no oversight. So, you know, you get a government job and like, not show up to it for 20 years and still get a paycheck and do other stuff on the side. So that's part of the reason why Greece is so, you know, indebted and, and what I mean is because they have this huge government dole in terms of people that are technically employed that are not actually producing anything, right? Okay, so that sounds like the Bahamas. And so a lot of this has to do with uh, institutional quality, right? So these people, these guys, Oslo, Blue Johnson, Robinson, back in 2001, uh, they were trying to figure out, so there was a big chicken and the egg problem, right? In terms of, well, these developing countries with crappy institutions, or I shouldn't say crappy, with, uh, you know, <laughs> All right, high permission. With crappy institutions, is it is it the fact that the crappy institutions are creating the low growth, or does low growth create crappy institutions, or, or not leave any room left over at the end for, for, for good institutions to take place? Right. So it's a big chicken and the egg problem. So how do you get to the root of this? Right. So they they needed an instrument. They needed something that was uh, that was not correlated to. Uh, the institutional quality, or, sorry, that was not determined by the institutional quality today, right? Something that's removed from it, but something that still has an influence on growth. So they looked to history, and what they found was that the settler mortality rates that were published in the newspapers were highly indicative of the institutional quality today. Why is that? Well, if the settler mortality rate, which again, widely published in all the newspapers, that's why we have such good data on it, right? But what did that mean? It was published in the newspapers. That meant that everybody could read it. It was public information, right? And so what would happen when the settler mortality rate was high in a place, you know, like Africa with, with you know, like high, uh, you know, any tropical climate is going to have higher mortality rate, right? And so they would set up what's called an extractive institution. 
extracted, right? Where essentially they they would just you know put enough troops and enough structure, legal structure there, so that they could you know get the resources that they wanted and leave, right? Um, so a lot of the places that had high settler mortality rates because of the behavior of the French and the English colonists and everything like that, and then the extractive institutions that they said have really poor institutional quality today. Whereas the places with uh, low set of mortality rates, right, they would go and they would, um, and I don't, I keep trying to think of the name that they use, but they would essentially copy, uh, you know, the English or French institutions over to those, right, when the set of mortality rate was low. Um, because they wanted to live there, they so that, so what you know if you want to live there, then you're going to want you know similar rule of law, similar court system, similar education system for your kids, right? And so it's this really, really you know kind of grounding, breaking paper in terms of how we think about economic development and how we are able to account for economic development, right? Um, so yeah, so that. I'll, I'll, I'll shoot that as, a, as an announcement to everybody if you're interested in the paper. Um, you know, don't get tied up too much into the main parts of it. I think read the intro, read the conclusion if you have any questions. Because it's got a little bit of a metric. But very interesting stuff. Um, okay. Moving on. Uh, so, what question was that? Ah, I see. Number one. <laughs> Let's go back to number one real quick. So this is uh, chapter nine, uh, page 295, number one in the question section. And so let's go ahead and just wrap it up. So this is all by tens. And this is all right. So uh, we have this demand one curve that starts at a hundred. And it's got a slope of uh, goes down ten in two units. All right. So this is D. Sorry, it's D two. And we've got this other demand curve. Shallow slope, it takes 10 to go down. One, or sorry, yeah, it takes 10 quantity to go down. To, or it's got to go So how do we figure out that kind of gap, right, where our marginal cost needs to be? That's, that is the question. So we are going to calculate the marginal cost of each one of these. So we know the marginal cost always starts at the same point as the demand curve, and it has twice the slope. So if this goes down 10 in 2, then this one's going to go down 10 in 1, right? So 
So how do we know which one to use for which part of it, right? Well, we know that the demand curve that we're going to use is going to be the lower demand curve, right? And so we just pick the marginal revenue that's associated with that demand. So this D1 has this MR1 all the way up until this K point. So that's the marginal revenue curve. Up until there. And then we're going to go down to this point. And then since we switch over to D2 after this king point, then we're now going to be on marginal revenue. Questions? So how do we get to the actual points, right? So if we start out at, this is a hundred. So the marginal revenue curve just has twice the slope of this. So it's going to be y equals 100 minus 10 times q. So we can just put in So I thought that this slope crossed right here, but it didn't. It crosses above that. It doesn't cross 90 and 2. The next point that it really crosses, this is what I should be using to calculate the slope, is the 10 and the 60. Right? So if it goes from 100 and 0 to 10 and 60, then the slope's going to be negative 2 thirds. It rains on on today, man. So we go down 40, then we go over 10. Negative 4. All right. Thank you. So we go down 40, and then over 10. We can't use this point anymore. It's not accurate. We have to go all the way to the stupid base cake. At uh, 60 and 10. Definitely. Okay, so yeah, we can use our point slope formula or we can just count the rise over. So we end up with negative 4, which makes way more sense than that this ends up being instead of negative 10, it's negative 8. Right, because it's just twice the slope of the demand curve. So since the demand curve is negative 4q, that's the slope of the demand curve, then the marginal revenue curve down here right, uh, is going to have a slope of negative 8q. So negative 8. And 
how do we find this point? Well, we're just going to plug 10 in to Q, right? So y equals 100 minus 8 times 10 is going to give us 20. That's how we're going to get that 20 over here. This marginal revenue amount, and of course, you know, we this in a straight line. <laughs> so, how do we figure out this marginal revenue line? Well, we have to do the same process, right? So, what's the equation for the band curve? It's going to be y equals 70 minus, and this one it goes down 10 in 10, so it's just a demand of one, right? 70 minus q. That's our demand curve, and so then our marginal revenue curve is going to be 70 minus 2q. So if we plug in 10 there, 70 minus 2 times 10, 70 minus 20, it's going to be equal to 50. So that's how we get 50 and 20. That's how we get the range exactly, right? So if we don't have a marginal cost that falls between that range, so when it falls between that range, let's use this light there. Okay, so when it falls between that range, then like, you just go, um, doesn't affect the price, right? Because the marginal revenue, marginal cost uh, rule only impacts the quantity star A, right? Right now, so it doesn't impact the price at all. So that's why it, it's, it, you know, it doesn't matter if the marginal cost is there or down here. It just has to be somewhere in this range between the 20 and 50. So again, what happens if it's not in that range? If instead we'll use this. Uh, for it, right? What if it's really, really, what if it's really, really high? If it's really high up here, right? Marginal cost high, then we always produce where the marginal cost uh, crosses the marginal revenue, but the marginal revenue is down here, so we would never actually produce it, right? So it would be zero. Our, our optimal quantity would be zero. That, that'd be the answer here. Marginal cost was that high. If the marginal cost was right here, so this is marginal cost high, quantity star equals zero. This is marginal cost high, but quantity star. Sorry. I should put this in. <laughs> uh, quantity star greater than zero. Um, but you're still not producing, you know, optimal compared to the rest of the team, right? You're still, so you're going to be charging more than everybody else. And as a result, uh, what? Yeah, yeah you're going to get less, less total revenue. That's how we end up getting this range, right? So, over this uh, for a long time in class, so we left this out. Just making sure you have Awesome. Let's work on homogeneous product core node duopoly number two on page 296. 296. And again, is chapter 9. Is number 2. All right. So um, we are told uh, the inverse demand of a homogeneous product for no duopoly is price is equal to 3, 200 minus. Oh, we already did this one. Yada, yada, yada. Uh, have D left, correct? So, what did we end up with for our? Uh, so, if we use our shortcuts, right? Um, so, remember, we have so we're given in the prompts price is equal to two hundred minus three times Q one plus Q two. We have cost one Q1 equals 26 Q1. We have cost two Q2 equals 32 Q2. All right, so uh, where's our page that helps us label the things, right? So that would be... Uh, 
277. Page 276 at the bottom, we have price is equal to A minus B Q1 times Q2, right? So in this case, what would A be? B is equal to negative three. G is the only one with it where you turned on today. So we are literally just unpacking this formula as P equals A minus B, right, times Q1 plus Q2. It's gonna be the same every time. Questions? Okay. Then, as on the top of page 277, We've got the marginal revenue of one is equal to A minus B Q one minus two B Q, or sorry, A minus B Q two minus two B Q one. So again, for those of you that uh, don't want to learn the calculus, the book doesn't make you. Number one, one Q two, A minus B. So, and then it even gives us the uh, solving at the end of it in terms of A and B, right? Pretty, pretty darn kind of them. So it's going to be Q1 equals R1, Q2 equals A minus C1 over 2B minus one half Q2. All right, we have all the information we need. Pages 266, 267. Thanks. Back to the end of the chapter. So again, we're asked what's the profit from earns, but I mean, we're going to do the reaction functions by doing this really simple way, right? So, um, I'll use my blue pen. I like it. So, we have uh, A part and our reaction function Q1 equals R1 over 2 is equal to what? It's equal to 200 minus. times three minus one half Q. So simplifying this a little bit, this is 174 divided by six. So I have this app right now that wakes me up. It's called Android Sleep. And um, so this is part of the reason why my math has been getting better lately, because I'll just show you, it's, it's essentially a bunch of these kind of awful, awful math problems that I have to solve in the morning to get up as I, I think it's, so let's see here. Yeah, 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 I'll show you. Uh, so preview. This is how I wake up every morning, guys. I do five of these. So you have to end up memorizing all these, and it wakes me up, guys. It's not the best way to wake up. <laughs> nope. Although I thought about having a calculator downstairs, because that would also wake me up. So some mornings if I'm getting pissed off and I can't do it right, then at least I'll get up and walk downstairs. <laughs> and then I'll use the calculator, right? Anyways, uh, <laughs> sorry. So, um, <laughs> just throw it, just turn it off. <laughs> Uh, all right, so that's uh, that's what we got for the first one. 
And then our second one, uh, u2 equals r2 of u1 is equal to, and so this is just, um, it's just the opposite of the other one, right? So it's a minus c2 over 2b minus 1 half u1. And so this is going to be 200 minus 32 divided by 6 minus 1 half u1. Cheating if you remember. <laughs> you must come in with an open mind every time. Okay, uh, so that's how we use the, the formulas, right? So you don't need to derive it each time. So how do we calculate the, the equilibrium market price, right? So this is what they're going to do in response to that other person's quantity. And if that is what they're going to do in response to this person's quantity, then how do we solve for equilibrium price. What do you say? Correct. We put them together and solve for the unknown. So we're going to take this one, this one, and set equal to each other, right? Because it's two equations, two unknowns. One fun time. All right. So uh, Q1 equals minus one half u2 u2 equals I guess you see that's why you u2 equals 28 minus one half one so what am I gonna do easiest way probably be I was thinking of bringing yeah let's just substitute this Entirely symmetrical, so we have to plug 20 back into this, right? So we end up with Q2 is equal to 28 minus 1 half times 20, which is 28 minus 10, which is 18. So now that we have both Q1 and Q2 star, then what can we do? We can plug those back into our price equation, right? Price is equal to 200 minus 3 times what? 20 plus 18. 20 plus 18 is 38. 38 times 3 is 136. 200 minus 136 is equal to 64. That is our equilibrium price. We all good on that. We also have this paper. <laughs> of course. So the last part of it, right, um, is really just plugging in the values that we have for, for each one, right? Um, so this paper, so that profit. Price is the same for everybody, right? It's 64 times Q1 is 20 
minus 26 times 20 ends up being 64 minus 26 times 20, which is 38 times 20, which is 706. <laughs> Hold on a second. We went, we, my confidence was too strong here, guys. 200 minus three times. 38, this should be 86. This is not 136, it's 116. I guess I should be offering extra credit if you guys uh, correct me, right? And so the price is actually 86. And so then as a result, this is instead of 64, this is 86, right? And then 86 minus 26 is 60. So it ends up being much easier math. And ends up being, yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> if you got it here, you'll get it. You should have been working off the answer key. Okay, so questions on that. So that's 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 the workaround, right? That's if you don't want to use calculus, you just want to use the the label things A, B, C1, C2, and put it in there. You still got to do some steps. You still got to set it equal to each other. You still got to do the right math. Of course, you can have a calculator on the exam. What? What work takes around. I can, what I'll do is I'll make these first. I think they're important. Some of the you know most hardcore economic stuff that we're probably going to do in these eight weeks. That's both exciting. That's both exciting and sad. So why don't we just take let's let's talk about the rest of the semester, right? Since we are so behind, we are behind. I mean, you know, we're supposed to go through all of them, right? So what are, here, let's take a look at the table of contents. Do, so we are getting through chapter nine right now, right? We got through our corno oligopoly. Uh, I'm gonna skip isoprofit curves. Uh, we will, work on changes in marginal costs, the two other types of oligopolies uh, in class on Wednesday. Um, but then, yeah, we've got uh, a lot of, of things that we're supposed to be covering, right? So I think this is really important to get through in terms of uh, how, to, how to discuss more advanced games, right? Because what's the nature of reality? It's not as if, uh, you know, you make a pricing decision once and you never, you know, you never have to deal with the consequences of it or whatever, right? So, there's actually more infinitely repeated games in terms of, of the kind of, of situations that we're in, right? So we, I, I definitely want to want to cover this uh, cover this topic in yeah. We'll start this on Monday and finish this on Wednesday, and I'd like to also get to people probably stop at chapter 11. Pricing strategies with market surplus, so we won't be able to get to uh, chapter 12, 13, or 14. I know, sad stuff. Um, but, you know, those, those weren't as mathy as these ones, so that's fine. We want to stick to the math. All right, so, but yeah, that'll make, that should make things a little bit um, 
less stressful in terms of uh, the final. And yeah, I'm giving the online class the option to double weight their final. Or yeah, if they so I'm gonna like calculate the grades with the final and the midterm as normal, and then also with the final is forty percent because, like I said, you guys did better on the midterm. I'm just going to calculate it both ways and see what grades better. <laughs> Your midterm was, it didn't count, but no, I'm kidding. I, I'm going to calculate your grades two ways. I'm going to calculate it once as normal with 20% to the midterm, 20% to the final, and I'm going to calculate it once with the final as 40% weight. So say you, you just hit the final out of the park and you only got you know, a B or something on the midterm. But everybody did well in the midterm. So, your, your final will do uh, will will bring your grade up more. Does that make sense? And, and your midterm won't. You, so the points that you might have lost on the midterm, right? Because it's twenty percent. So say you got eighty percent, you lost four points total when your midterm your final grade. So, but if you get a ninety percent on your final, oh, then I guess you lost four points total on your grades too. But yeah, I'll just calculate it both ways. And so it, whichever way is higher, I'll take that grade. You too. I'll see you on Wednesday. Yeah. Well, and I'll like I'll, like I said, I'll probably make the chapter nine questions.